Of course, that uh, our greatest concern today will be the spread of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, the efforts of our government to uh, try and contain that and so on and so forth. But there's equally, uh, it's almost dual track. We have another concern, and that is about the uh, ban on the use of uh, chemical fertilizer, the import of uh, chemical fertilizer and so on. Um, I have some statistics, of course, uh, to... Uh, uh, to throw at you. Uh, um, back in the uh, the uh, Sri Lanka's uh, population was 6 million. Uh, by 1952, um, there was a shortage of rice. And uh, Sri Lanka entered into what is now known, or was then known, as the rubber rice pact with China. Back in the 50s, uh, the life expect expectancy was 52 years old, thereabouts. Roll on, the life expectancy now is approximately 78, and in between we've imported uh, chemical fertilizers. So if the stated aim of this government is uh, the pursuance of an organic, uh, an all organic fertilizer for agro-industry, if that is to give us a healthy lifestyle, uh, well, let's find out what the pros and cons are, shall we? We've got here with us a specialist uh, in the subject of the environment, uh, Rohan Petiagoda, who's um, an environmentalist and uh, many other things too. But he's right here with us on Newsline Live. Very good evening to you, Rohan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for coming on the program. So I put it to you. In 1950, population 6 million, shortage of rice, rubber rice packed, the life expectancy in the 50s around 52 years old, 52 years. Um, over now, fast forward to here, we have um, we've imported tons and tons and tons of uh, chemical uh, fertilizer. The life expectancy is 78. And um, so I'm rather wondering and puzzled as to how, if this chemical fertilizer is so bad for us, uh, why is it that we're living much longer now? I don't think there's any evidence that the fertilizer causes problems to our health. Right. Um, there's a perception amongst the public that this is the case because people uh, have been told repeatedly by some environmental activists that our environment is being polluted and poisoned. The fact of the matter is that, as you mentioned, as at 1960, when I was a five-year-old kid, we had a terrible malnutrition problem in Sri Lanka. Ten percent of children died before they saw their fifth birthday. Today, it's 0.7 percent, 0.7 percent, a tiny fraction. As at 1973, about 40 percent of children in Sri Lanka yeah. were malnourished. Right. And that meant that we had a huge issue with stunting, with children's IQ, for example, and it disabled a, a whole generation of children because our population was expanding rapidly. Between 1960 and now, our population has gone up by 120%. And food supply had to keep pace with that. But as at 1960, about half our rice, for example, was still being imported, and as you mentioned, with great difficulty with with ministers going around the world with a begging bowl trying to get rice. Indeed. But now we're not just self-sufficient, but we are, we've got about 30% excess rice. So from 1960 to now, rice production in Sri Lanka has gone up by 465%. That's an incredible, I mean, if, if a company could give that kind of growth, yeah. its shares would sell like crazy. The, uh, the group financial director would be very happy. Would be a very happy person, and so would the shareholders. And we are the shareholders of this prosperity that the agriculture sector has given us. Yeah. Not just with rice, but with everything. In 1975, food imports accounted for more than 50% of our total imports. Now it's less than 25%. And that's a huge success. So if there is an environmental cost being paid for this success, of course we've got to take that into account. Yeah. But the fact is that there's very little evidence of an environmental cost. There have been papers published on this subject, there have been studies done by all the universities, but there's no data to suggest 
that we have an environmental problem on our hands as a result of using fertilizer or pesticides? The, the, the problem, uh, uh, or part of the problem, appears to be, to me, that the uh, change always brings about opposition, because change, people are uh, wary of change. Uh, but I think if we look at, for example, uh, in Sri Lanka, the Uma Oya project, um, and if we compare on a completely different scale, but if we compare that with the, um, uh, the Aswan Dam, uh, Egypt's um, agriculture fortunes were changed after uh, the then president, I think it was Sadat, uh, who came along and insisted that they start the work of the Aswan Dam. And uh, even though previously they had uh, uh, offers of money, um, financial help from the states, from Russia, from France, and so on, uh, the Egyptians were, uh, were wary of that funding. But one of the problems they discovered as to why they couldn't do this project was because uh, somebody said to them that, well, look, you know, if we do the Aswan Dam as it is, uh, the temple of Abu Simbel is down there and it will get, uh, it will be drowned. And so Sadat had the, I believe it was Sadat, uh, I, I hope I'm correct there, but uh, the president, being a military man, uh, had the most simplest of um, solutions. He ordered that the temple of Abu Simbel be moved brick by brick to where it stands now. So that was change. Uh, and so when I sit, talk about the Umaoya project, well, yes, there are people who had to be rehoused and so on. And, and, and uh, it was all part of uh, the transaction that uh, the government of the day would relocate these people. And unfortunately, uh, many years later, they still hadn't relocated quite a number of them. But today, we see that water m moving in towards Monoragla and so on, and you know, it, things are a happening. So change seems to be uh, the the big, the sort of big, um, frightening um, aspect here. How, how much of that is playing a role in this government's aim towards? a full organic um, state, if you like. I think the problem here is that usually when you make a profound change, you think very carefully about the consequences of that, especially consequences you can't assess easily. And this word organic is used in many different contexts. So the proper use of the word is when your agriculture has an organic certification. And these certifications are given out by agencies who are specialized in assessing agricultural practice and who make uh, an, a determination as to whether your agriculture is in fact organic. But if we take something like the tea sector, we have to remember that tea in Sri Lanka, about 70% of our tea comes from the leaf grown by 400,000 smallholders. Right. Now this means getting each of those smallholders an organic certification and assume you get them an organic certification. But if one of those smallholders then uses a pesticide, which is prohibited by the organic agency, which has been smuggled into Sri Lanka because everything gets smuggled into Sri Lanka, yeah. and then our tea is found to be contaminated, we'll never know from where which one of the 400,000 produced that pesticide-ridden tea. That damages the whole national brand. And if you lose your organic certification, you'd use, lose maybe 30 or 40 percent of the value. So we are in grave danger of losing the identity and the purity of Ceylon tea. The purity of Ceylon tea is also important because all the importing countries have got things called maximum residue limits, MRLs. And they say how much of each kind of approved pesticide you can have in your tea. Now, if you deviate from that, you get into big trouble. So we had this problem with President Sirisena and uh, Rani Vikramasinghe in their government. In 2015, they made a cabinet decision to ban the use of the herbicide glyphosate. Yeah. As a result of that, there was no herbicide available in the market because they didn't say, here's the alternative. There was no opportunity for the agriculture sector, the Tea Research Institute and the Rice Research Institute and so on, to say, here's how we can adapt to this new rule. So Japan, for example, would allow uh, one part per million in tea of glyphosate. Now you suddenly said no glyphosate. So what the tea plantation people started doing 
was they started using rice herbicides in the tea sector. But none of these herbicides had been approved for tea. Right. So, for example, there's a common rice herbicide called MP MCPA. Yeah. And <coughs> when that started to get used for this purpose, yeah. the Japanese discovered this and they stopped importing our tea. So the, the problem is that... And that's an important market, Japan? Japan's an important market, but every market is an important market for us. Right. And we shouldn't sink to the bottom because, you see, we are always talking about the quality of Ceylon tea. So we want to sell to sophisticated markets. A lot of our tea, of course, goes to unsophisticated markets, Iraq, Syria, you know, and this, this kind of country. But that's the bulk. But a lot of our tea, the expensive teas, go to Germany, the EU countries, Japan, Australia, the United the States. The more and so mature on. and sophisticated yes. markets. And they've got their standards. And we can sometimes break those standards by making changes without thinking about them carefully. And that's why I, I worry about this. So the thing is always when you make change, it can be a good thing. Yeah. But you've got to do it carefully. And remember that we've got some of the best agricultural experts in the world, in the agriculture department, in the rice, rubber, tea, coconut research. Yes, they really know their stuff. And they know their stuff. So when we make a decision without going by their advice and asking them how can we adapt to this new challenge, you might be making a big blunder. And a blunder like this was made once before by Mrs. Bandaranaike in 1965. Yeah. She, in her manifesto for the yeah. election that year, she said that she's going to nationalize plantations. Yeah. And what happened? If your plantation is going to be nationalized, you're not going to invest. She lost the election, but still, investment in the plantation sector plummeted. Some of our best plantation experts migrated to other countries. They went and started up tea plantations in various parts of the world. Well, including in Kenya, who was Kenya. one of the greatest beneficiaries of that exodus. And in 1965, Kenya was less than 10% of our tea production. Yes. Now it is 200% of our tea production. The skills export from Sri Lanka is what helped Kenya to get started. Absolutely. And now they are amongst our biggest competitors. So that was a profound mistake. So our tea industry went into a two decade, a 20 year decline. From 1965 to 1985, it was downhill all the way. And then to recover it came the smallholders in the south, in Akurasa and places like uh, Moravaka and so on, in, yeah. in the Deniaya area. And thanks to them, the tea industry was resurrected. But then they paid a heavy en environmental pr price because a lot of those smallholders encroached onto state land, they cut down state forests, to the present day, a lot of the 400,000 tea smallholders don't have title deeds to their land. So it's a very, very sensitive industry and a very sensitive constituency. Because between tea and rice, remember, yeah. we have about 600,000 landowners. And with their families, this is about 10% of the Sri Lankan population. And we don't want to mess with a constituency that is that sensitive. Um, thank you very much, uh, um, Rohan uh, Petiagode. And um, of course, uh, let me remind uh, our viewers that uh, you can uh, text us with your questions by SMS, preferably uh, 0772 300 305. After all, we are in discussion with an expert in these matters, and uh, it's your chance to ask the questions that you want answers to, which is all about uh, Newsline is. Uh, or what Newsline is all about. Uh, now then, um, Ron, when we go to the supermarkets, even here, the, the Colombo supermarkets, you'll see a corner of the um, veg section that will say organic. It's the same out in Europe. Uh, I've just come back uh, and the, the better supermarkets will have uh, their organic sector. But I couldn't help but notice the similarity between over there and over here. And that was this, that those sections were rather empty in comparison to the rest of the agro uh, product, suggesting to me uh, that it must be to do with price, because it is, it is a niche market. So if it's a niche market, and you know, compared to our capacity, our, our spending power in this country, I'm wondering whether this is all a little bit going after the wrong thing. It's dangerous, especially if you haven't assessed the risks and the benefits. And I can't see 
the risks and I certainly can't see the benefits of this program rolled out nationally in one fell swoop. Uh, it, it might be something you can try to roll out <coughs> in steps. Yeah. Um, but Ron, do you, do you feel that, let, let's ask the question up front and open, which is what we tend to do on Newsline Live. Uh, lest anyone think that um, is uh, any different now. Do you feel, sometimes I get the feeling anyway, that all this business of going fully organic and all that, that whole concept is merely uh, a red herring? It is, to f it is to hide the very fact that Sri Lanka doesn't have enough foreign exchange currently? Yes, that, that could be part of it. And certainly the fertilizer subsidy was part of that. I am personally opposed to the fertilizer subsidy or any kind of subsidy. Right. Subsidies should be for the poor, yeah. but the fertilizer subsidy was benefiting largely well-off people. And so in that sense, I, I don't think it was well focused and certainly I'm happy that the government has, seems to have got rid of that. But the problem is that organic by itself isn't a solution to any of these problems. The organic concept uses certain types of pesticides itself. It's just that it uses old-fashioned pesticides. So for example, it uses copper sulfate as a fungicide. Copper sulfate is very toxic. It's toxic to humans, it's certainly toxic to aquatic life, so you can have problems. And also the perception that organic food is absolutely safe is an illusion. It's an illusion. It is, because it, it carries its own dangers. If you, if you look uh, on the internet, you can yeah. see that as recently as um, 2011, there was a outbreak of a thing called a Shiga toxin uh, caused by bacteria in organic fenugreek sprouts, uh, what we call uluhal. Mm -hmm. and this killed 53 people in Germany, hospitalized more than 6,000, and left 850 Germans with chronic kidney disease for life. Now, if a chemical, agrochemical had done that, can you imagine the worldwide outrage and panic? But this was organic. So it's not to say that organic food is safe. And this is not an isolated incident. There have been incidents like this in other parts. It's well of the world. documented. It's well documented. I mean, you can look it up on the internet. If you look for Shiga toxin on the internet and Germany 2011, the whole case is documented with lots of studies because people died. 53 people died. Maybe uh, we can invite the uh, public to get on your Google and start Googling. In the meantime, we are going to take a little peek at the headlines for this evening's primetime news from News First. We'll see you on the other side. With Faraz Shaukutali. Administer the first dose of vaccines at centres providing the second dose of the jab, a directive from the President. Delta variant cases in Colombo surge. Home-based management of COVID-19 cases to commence from Monday. The country is on the verge of a calamity, a statement from the opposition leader. Convener of the Inter-University Students' Federation and Chairman of the Sri Jai Watanarpura University Students' Federation remanded. News First, Newsline with Faraz Shaukutali. And welcome back. Uh, I'm in conversation with uh, Mr. Rohan Vethiagoda. Um, mm, Mr. Petyagoda, I have got a question from one of our viewers. So the big question is this, but actually it's two questions. So the big questions are, one, is there a correlation between CKD and chemical fertilizers? And two, why the heck has this decision been made so quickly and in the middle of a pandemic? I, I uh, yes, I don't have an answer for your second question, I'm, I'm afraid, because we don't know the reasons why the government made this. No one's published any data to explain why this sudden decision was made. Right. Uh, there was a statement in the President's manifesto about a gradual shift to organic, 
and it even stated that the government would give free uh, chemical fertilizer and organic fertilizer to farmers. But obviously that can't be done in the, in the middle of the present economic situation. Part of the reason that uh, people cite for this shift away from chemical fertilizers is that it has caused the chronic kidney disease that we see in parts of Sri Lanka. Well, actually, since 2008 and now, there have been more than 250 scientific and medical studies published in international journals on this question. And not one of them has found a causative uh, reason for kidney disease to stem from fertilizers. In the past year, from 2020 to now, about 30 papers have been published, scientific papers, in the international peer-reviewed journals on this subject, and every one of them refers to this disease as of unknown etiology. In other words, they don't know the reason. So it's CKDU. It's CKDU still. So if there's, there have been proposals that we call it a CKD of agricultural yeah. origin, but there's no substantiation for that. And you know, there have been very erudite people who've done studies on the problem of is there uh, fertilizer-related uh, pollution in our waterways and so on. Uh, there's, for example, Professor Udeni Edirisinghe led a study in 2016 that referred to this uh, problem. And they investigated the levels of uh, arsenic and cadmium, for example, which are common pollutants that could be associated with uh, chemical fertilizers. There are standards for these things, but assuming that the standards were exceeded, there might have been pollution, and, and they did this for the whole of the Malvatu Oya Basin over a fairly long period of time. And they looked not just at the quality of the water, but whether there was accumulation of pesticides in the tissues of fishes, for example, in the Malvatu Oya Basin. And they found, for example, arsenic and cadmium, but in minute quantities that aren't harmful to our health. Now, we must remember that a lot of chemicals are in the modern environment. For example, we all drink chlorinated tap water and chlorine is a poison. We all, we all consume iodized salt and iodine is a poison. We all use fluoride in our toothpaste. But fluoride is a poison if you take it in excessive quantities. Right. So small amounts of these so-called poisons are part of our environment every day and they're good for us. And we now live much longer than we did if you and were we, in the 50s. We are living 30% longer than our great-grandparents generation on, on average. Um, Yes, I'd like to acknowledge that um, uh, Rohan Petriagoda has a doctorate and also he is a Rolex Award winner for innovation. Thank you very much. The public are uh, probably concerned that I am not referring to you with more uh, oomph. And so, uh, Mr. Petriagoda, I, uh, I am referring to you as you wanted me to refer to you. Thank you. Uh, but thank you. Now then, uh, somebody says here, why are not guests like yours, uh, why are they not consulted by the people who make these decisions? I'm afraid that although I've posed and read the question out, that is obviously something that you can't answer. We will have to ask Sir that uh, and, and so on. Um, in a nutshell, isn't this a case of uneducated boys trying to do the work of educated adults? Well, I don't agree with either of those things, actually, because on the, on the first question, I don't want to be regarded here as a expert in this field. There are experts in the field, in the Department of Agriculture, in the, in the Ministry of Health, and in the research institutions associated with agriculture. I am here, I think I, Faraz invited me, because I released a, a lecture on YouTube a couple of weeks ago, which has got a lot of traction uh, on, this, on this issue. And uh, there I presented in, grave, in great detail the facts and figures, the charts, the statistics, and the scientific information that's available on the question of pesticides and fertilizers. So I'm, I'm representing myself as a science journalist here, not as an expert. But the experts are out there, and they're very good. The, the other thing to remember is that these decisions about policy should yeah. be made by politicians. That's why we elect them. But usually, the policy-making process is structured 
in an inverted form. In other words, the research institutions and ministries and departments send policy proposals up to the government. The cabinet decides those decisions and sends them down for implementation. Here, we've got the opposite happening. The government makes a decision and sends the, de the decision down. And people don't know why it was made, because mm -hmm. there's no data, there's no information given as to why this decision was necessary. So people are bewildered. I mean, especially the, the large numbers of stakeholders whose livelihoods depend on this. At the worst possible time, you referred to this also. This is probably Sri Lanka's worst economic year. Yeah. Mind you, we've seen a tsunami, we've seen a war, and we've seen very nearly famine in the 1960s. This is a much bigger threat because we've lost the main legs of our economy. We've lost Middle East employment to a large extent. We've lost tourism. We've, the garment industries are on their knees. And agriculture is the last one left standing. And to try this grand experiment on agriculture in the course of one year, something that's never been attempted in our history or in the history of any other country on the planet, when you try this grand experiment, were it to fail, and I suspect it will, the cost is enormous. And as I told you, uh, for us in, in a policy intervention Mrs. Bandar Naik made in 1965, nobody thought that that one paragraph in her manifesto was going to collapse the tea industry for 20 years. So very small policy interventions that aren't thought out carefully can have massive repercussions on an economy. Isn't this uh, uh, ban uh, in terms of the tea industry, isn't it a, a, a fiasco waiting to happen now? It is. It's already happening. Mind you, I don't pin the blame entirely on this government. This, this rot started with the Maitripala Sirisa and Ronil Vikramasinghe government in 2015 because yeah. they could have stemmed it then. Uh, when the interference, as I see it, politically started happening. And I think one of your viewers asked you this question, why, what was my response? I was in the tea board as chairman at the time. Yeah. I struggled vehemently against that. I argued with my minister, he argued with the president, I argued with the president, we wrote angry letters, and eventually in 2018, when the Japanese crisis uh, began uh, with our tea imports to Japan, I quit the tea board because basically I couldn't see the point of sitting uh, as a part of a government that was determined to fail, as it did. Six million kilos of tea were lost to Japan. Well, and expensive tea, because yeah. the Japanese drink the best possible tea. They're a very discerning market. So you don't want to mess with the Japanese market, especially when they are friends of Ceylon tea. What could have been the reason why uh, the combine of Sirisena and Vikram Singha uh, took that decision. What I have no have idea. I have no idea. President Sirisena made the announcement about the ban on glyphosate not at a cabinet meeting. He made it at a school prize giving. And that's how I saw it in the newspaper. And I was shocked. And I, I wrote to him I, through my minister immediately. And I said, don't do this. You're going to send our industry into a tailspin. But you couldn't stop him. And I, I suspect now he knows that he made a grave mistake. Well, that's a little bit like the, that other chappy who, who now admits that he made a big mistake uh, in the helping Hamban to the sc uh, scandal. Uh, but it's too blessed late, isn't it? When you, know, uh, you, when you uh, years later, after you've done the damage, you say, oh, I made a terrible mistake. And that, that announcement uh, was made in a market, uh, you know, in a, in a Sunday market. So, um, but. Ron Bet, you're going to, you know, thank you very much for being on uh, Newsline Live. Um, many, many questions. Uh, perhaps uh, you ought to come on our longer program, uh, Face the Nation, uh, where you, there'll be more time to discuss this in uh, better and greater detail. But thank you very much. We've, uh, we've much enjoyed your presence here. My pleasure. Thank you. And that's the way it was on Newsline Live this evening. Do take care. Have a good weekend ahead of you and of course as always god bless you it's now time for the prime time news